Welcome in to Daily Faceoff Live, your go-to source for everything hockey, live every weekday at noon Eastern. What's up, everybody? Welcome in to Daily Faceoff Live, presented by Botano.ca. The game starts now with Botano 19 plus. Please play responsibly. He is former NHL netminder Mike McKenna, current Daily Faceoff analyst. Mike, how you doing? Man, good. You know what's cool? There's only three games in the docket last night, so I had a chance to really focus on it. And um, sometimes those nights are are pretty good. Ten and eleven, kind of hard to keep track of. So I was pretty happy to have that last night. How about you? How you doing, Frank? Yeah, I'm good. Thrilled to have uh, our new partner Batano on board with us. So welcome to the show. And uh, yeah, as you mentioned, some really interesting games last night. Let's throw two minutes and thirty seconds up on the clock, and let's start with. The Vegas Golden Knights, Pavel Dorofayev. Where'd this guy come from? Seven goals in his last 10 games. He plays the hero for the Vegas Golden Knights in Minnesota on Monday night as they get two goals from him and a a goal in the shootout uh, in the last sort of 40 seconds there to stun the Minnesota Wild. Uh, When you look at this Golden Knights team, Mike, I've gone through the process of trying to rank in order the balance of power in the West. And I've been saying for a while that it's a coin flip, but for the last number of weeks, I've been coming up with out of six teams that I think are authentic possibilities to move to the Western Conference Final or the Stanley Cup Final. I've routinely had the Golden Knights six. Is there a chance that I'm overlooking Mm -hmm. them? Yeah, I think so, because they just keep winning. Like, they find ways, and so much of it for the Golden Knights is how they start games, Frank. When they score the first period, they're 35-5 and score the first goal, they're 35-5-2. and two. And if they're leading after one, they're 29-4. and four. And a lot of the wins that they've aggregated lately have been without Shea Theodore in the lineup. They've been missing Riley Smith until last night, who did draw back into the lineup and, of course, had the shootout winner look great in his return. Uh, but what re- really impresses me about Vegas is that they can get out to leads, and sustain, but they can also come from behind. So like, even though the advanced numbers don't always favor the Golden Knights, they're second most in the, in the NHL with wins trailing after two. So they weren't even the better team in the second and third period. And they beat the wild last night. They found a way. So I think they're plucky. I think Bruce Cassidy's done an excellent job of putting a system in place that they can play to. And now you've got young players like Dora Fay of drawing in, right? This is what Vegas needed. Look at this skill on this shootout winner. Dora Feo is a homegrown product. He's a third round draft pick. Last season in the American League, his full season, he had 27 goals. Okay, that's a pretty big number for a 21 year old. He needs to play with good players. He's been with Carlson and Smith, and he's responded. This is the first homegrown forward that Vegas has really been able to have that scoring, Frank. So for the future, that's good. He was a healthy scratch just the night before. He's got seven goals in his last nine, 10 games, man. Big difference for him. Yeah, I don't think he's going anywhere in in Bruce Cassidy's lineup anytime soon. We'll get to the Golden Knights and their goaltending situation in a little bit with the blue paint. But when you look at the rest of this team, like, will someone like Jack Eichel get a shot in the arm from getting his first taste of the Stanley Cup playoffs? Like, I'm just wondering who who else is going to step up for this team when it matters most, given some of the pieces that they're missing. Yeah, well, look at look to the back end. Okay, uh, Alex Petrangelo to me has been the linchpin of the Vegas Golden Knights this year, and I think he's bringing people along. The focus isn't on Jack Eichel any longer. It's not just him. It's been through the lineup, so um, I think he's somebody to keep an eye on. Also, a bellwether for that team for me. It's how William Carlson plays when he's on his game defensively, taking care of business at the in the back end. That team plays better in the offensive zone as well. Mm, interesting. By virtue of picking up a point, the Minnesota Wild formally clinched a spot in the Stanley Cup playoffs. Mike, the Wild have been one of the NHL's hottest team for the last six weeks or so. When you look at the Wild, we had a discussion last week on whether or not they are a true Stanley Cup contender or not. But I'm more interested in who's their X factor going to be. It seems like they're pretty close to getting Kirill Kaprizov back in the lineup. Obviously, he's a huge part of what they do. For me, I I can't help but notice the run that Matt Boldy's been on. This is their record since the Kirill Kaprizov injury. They're 7-2-3. Their goals for is up in a huge way. For me, the X factor is Boldy. When Kaprizov went out of the lineup, he had 17 goals. Take a look at their leading scorers now. He's got 30. That's 13 goals in the last 12 games for Boldy, including two hat tricks. So for me, he's their X factor. And Mike, when I think about something that could sink this team, it ties into Boldy and Kaprizov. 
It's their offense. They have the 23rd ranked offense in the NHL this season. And that's the lowest ranking of any playoff team that's that's going to make it. So goals have been hard to come by. Getting Kaprizov back will help. Who do you think is the X factor and what's one thing that you think could sink this team? Yeah, I think that's part of it. We'll talk about goaltending in a little bit. That could factor in. But I think those depth pieces that the Wild picked up at the trade deadline looked right towards Marcus Johansson who's got 13 points in 16 games with the Wild since coming over from the Capitals. He's been excellent for them. Can he keep that up? You know, there's players on the Wild that are getting more ice time, more opportunity with Kaprizov out of the lineup. Johansson's been a great piece. Does Gus Nyquist come in and help keep them uh, being able to score? Basically, the depth has come through for Minnesota in the last month, month and a half. That wasn't the case previously. I think there's a whole vibe going on there. John Klingberg has also been good. So for me, Frank, it comes down to depth. Can they get contributions throughout their third, fourth lines? So what may sink this team? Scoring, same as you. I think it's straight up that. When they haven't been able to, to click this year, you know, they're in the bottom third of the league. It's only been in this past month that they've ramped up. And one thing to keep an eye on is their power play. Only at 15% during the month of March. It hasn't been great all season. A lot of it's been at five on five. Yeah, it's funny because the power play ha is what's been saving them. Uh, at least when you think back to this team right out of the All-Star break, they couldn't score goals at even strength. A lot of what they did accomplish was on the power play. And so you're right, when it goes dry, it's pretty ugly. Um, for me, I think there's also a, a, a mental component to this team as well. There always is, but they've had some really tough stretches this year, and I can't tell whether that's going to be a benefit to them for having worked their way through to the other side, or if do they potentially go into panic mode if things don't go their way to start. I think back to last year's first-round series, Mostly the same roster against the St. Louis Blues. They were in the driver's seat. They should have been able to win that series. And they went out like a lamb instead of a lion. Yeah, and they also had a you know pretty early exit against the Vegas Golden Knights just two years ago as well, where they couldn't get over the hump in the Stanley Cup playoffs. So I think there's a real boogeyman effect that they're going to have to be able to get past if they're going to go deep. But, man, they've done so much without Kaprizov in the lineup. You know, so you have to wonder what they're going to look like when he comes back. If Gus Nyquist draws in, they should be even better than they have been lately. Yeah, I totally agree. Kaprizov, I think one of the true game changers. I had him earlier this season as one of only 17 franchise players in the NHL. Uh, let's talk about the Dallas Stars, who also formally clinched their playoff berth. No surprise on Monday evening. This Stars team, Mike, you think can go the distance? I do, man. I picked him. I got a piece coming out today on Daily Faceoff on why I think the Dallas Stars will come out of the West. And, you know, a lot of it comes down to I think the West is really murky right now. I don't think there's a real front runner. And for me, it's the Colorado Avalanche and the Dallas Stars. And even though Dallas has lost three of their four games to Colorado this year in the regular season, you also have the Pete DeBoard effect as the head coach of the Stars. He knows how to beat the Avalanche in playoffs, did it previously with the Vegas Golden Knights two seasons ago. Um, but with the, with the Stars, the only thing that really I have questions about is their defensive core. Because beyond Miro Heiskin and Issa Lindell, there's not a lot there. Ryan Suter's had a challenging season. They do turn pucks over. The whole focus under DeBoer, Frank, is to go forward and to go quick forward. They can turn it over. Ottinger, who I still think is the X factor in a good way for the Dallas Stars, you may disagree because he hasn't been great lately. I think he can win a series over Colorado if that's what it comes down to. And that first line for Dallas has been the best 5-on-5 five five line in the league, Frank. They have more goals, more points than any other. you got the Benessance going on with 32 goals. So I think this is a diverse team, and they're scoring. I think they added well at the deadline with Domi and Dodonov. And Mason Marchman is going to be back. And he played really well before his knee injury, Frank. So I believe in the stars. Now shoot me down. <laughs> no, I, I'm not going to because I, I think the yeah! factor right. in net is is Jake Ottinger. Like you look at these last yeah. 10 games that Ottinger's played, he's got a great record, but a suboptimal save percentage at the 897. And you think back to last year's playoffs and he was the difference maker for the stars. He was the guy that can win you not just a couple games, but can win you a couple series, I think, with the talent that he has. And so uh, he's someone that when he's in the zone is capable of going on a run. Um my questions about this Stars team are the depth scoring. You know, you mentioned the Benessons, but outside of that first line, which really seems to drive so much, yeah, they've had some impressive seasons from a Wyatt Johnson uh, really quietly hitting 20 goals at his young age. And they've gotten some, you know, impressive play from others at times. 
but it, I think it really begins to drop off in a hurry. The one thing the Stars have going for them is if they're not scoring, they're also really difficult to play against further down the lineup. But I also think when you look at these next, you know, 10 days, 12 days of the season, Mike, places a pretty big emphasis on trying to win the division. There's no easy road. There's no way to really avoid a tough matchup, particularly when it comes to the second round in that division. But if you can avoid one in the first round and I think get one of the wild card teams, whether it's the Kraken or the Winnipeg Jets, you know, you're going to put your team in a much better position to succeed. So I think the Stars have a lot to play for. I agree with you completely. Thing that they have going for them, their seventh best penalty power play in the league, third best on the PK. And I think they can play any style you want. You want to run and gun, that first line will come at you with Hintz, Pavelski, Robertson. On top of that, they can play pretty gritty. That's a team I don't want to go into a battle with. So um, I think they're going to be good, but it's not going to be an easy road out, especially with Colorado lurking. Yeah, the Stars have the best goal differential in the Western Conference. They're tied with the Minnesota Wild in points for the division lead with 98. But as mentioned, the Colorado Avalanche lurking with two games in hand and just two points back. Let's talk about a sad story, one that surfaced in Russia this morning. Uh, top prospect Matvey Mishkov, his father was found dead. Uh, there were reports over the last couple of days that his father was missing um, on Saturday and reportedly was found uh, in a lake in Sochi, Russia, um, dead on Tuesday morning. Uh, this news has been confirmed by the Russian Hockey Federation. And Mike, not an easy subject to talk about. Um, but Matvey Mishkov, I think this sort of in a, in a, not in a morbid way, but it adds to the intrigue of his draft profile and position in the sense that this is an uber talented player in a lot of years, you know, not with a Connor Bedard at the top of the draft rankings would be challenging for that number one spot, but there's geopolitical issues at play with the war ongoing with Ukraine. There is the contractual status of Matvey Mishkov moving forward. He's under contract in Russia's KHL for the next few seasons and would be unable to come over to North America sooner than that. And then, you know, you add all those things together and you say, well, hold on a second here. Is someone willing to take a, a, a stab on this guy knowing that you may not see him for a while? If you're a general manager of an NHL team that's you know performed pretty poorly over the last few years to be in that lottery zone, who's to say you're even going to be around and in the position when this player is ready and able to come to the NHL and make an impact? So to me, there's so many question marks moving forward, and this is sort of one more that's added to the list. How will his father's death impact this guy that's clearly a rising star? Yeah, and it's such it's such a sad story. Fifty one years old um, for, for Michkov's father. It's just too young, and you do have to wonder about all these things, Frank. But what it comes down to for me is that if you look at Alex Ovechkin's metrics, Michkov really lines up just as favorably, like in the road leading up to the NHL for Ovechkin. Like this is a super talented player, and I think you kind of have to look it through look it through the lens of Kirill Kaprizov coming later in his career, Vladimir Tarasenko in the same way, taking a few years uh, while being under contract before eventually coming over. If it's the best player available and you believe in him, I think as a, as a GM, you've got to take him, even if there's an incubation period, even if there is that worry, like this is, but this is the problem you've run into. How many years have we had this going into a draft where there's been question marks about Russian players, Frank, the geopolitical effects of it. Frankly, man, they're just tiresome. You know, I, I, I wish we didn't have to deal with this because there's so many good players and good people in Russia that deserve the chance to play in the NHL and early. Uh, and there's just so many factors that make it murky at times. Yeah, I mean, we were just spending a bit of time talking about Kirill Kaprizov for the Minnesota Wild, taken in the fifth round. Uh, way back in 2015, a big part of that is due to the same discussion that we're having, one that's only sort of been enhanced or heightened by the geopolitical sphere and what's going on in Russia and Ukraine at the moment. Um, and Kaprizov, drafted in 2015, didn't come to the NHL until 2020. But then you look at the impact that he has and you say, well, why aren't more teams taking a chance? It's going to be so fascinating to see what happens with Matvey Mishkov and uh, sending our condolences to him and to his family uh, in Russia today. Uh, let's get to this week's edition of the Blue Paint. Let's talk goalies. 
All right, Mike, it's time for this week's edition of the Blue Paint and happy to dive in for some really interesting goalie talk ahead of the Stanley Cup playoffs. We've got to start with the Minnesota Wild. We were just teasing uh, some discussion about him, uh, their goaltending and their crease. And their goalie, Philip Gustafson, second only to Linus Olmark in save percentage, so second best in the NHL and recently earned the start against the Avs. Is he primed to be Minnesota's starting goaltender on opening night of the playoffs in in place of Mark Andre Fleury? Well, from the topical standpoint, Frank, it sure seems like Philip Gustafson should be the number one goaltender in Minnesota, especially when you're going on the statistics. He's got a 932 save percentage this season. He's won 20 games. And even recently, he's got a 920 save percentage and a 258 goals against in his last six, right? Three, one, and two. Like that should all lead towards a goaltender starting in the Stanley Cup playoffs. But here's the thing Gustafson and Marc Andre Fleury have been straight up alternating games since March 11th, six games apiece. And Fleury's numbers largely mirror Gustafson's. He's also 4 1 and 1 Fleury. Is. So he's won one more game in that span. He's got a 919 save percentage. But in those games, Fleury's allowed four goals in three of them. So, like, this is a real yin and yang here. And I think what it comes down to for me is that you look at the loyalty that's been there for Marc-Andre Fleury, from whether it's with Billy Guerin as the GM, whether it's with Dean Evison as a head coach. Last year, Fleury came in at the trade deadline, and he supplanted Cam Talbot. Cam Talbot was 13-0-3. and in his last 16 starts for the Minnesota Wild. And he got benched at the start of the Stanley Cup playoffs by Evison in favor of Fleury, who has Stanley Cups under his belt, a Vezina. I think this is what it comes down to. Gustafson's got a 932 on the year. Fleury's got a 910. But Fleury's been a lot better lately, and Fleury's been winning games. I actually think Marc-Andre Fleury still has the inside track to be the number one goaltender, starting goaltender for the Minnesota Wild when playoffs start. I think the difference is the leash is not going to be long at all. You could see Gustafson or Fleury uh, in some sort of a tandem, I think, even in the even towards the end of the playoffs. It's so interesting because you think back to last year in the playoffs. Yes, Dean Evison went with Mark andre Fleury in Game 1, but then in Game 6 with the season on the line, went back to Cam Talbot. So Fleury started the right. first five, a 906 save percentage in those five games, and then he ends up turning to Talbot for what ended up being the elimination game as he wasn't able to stave off the Blues. So let's talk about Mark andre Fleury's former team in the Vegas Golden Knights, or I should say one of them because that stop in Chicago seems to be so forgotten to this point. <laughs> but the Golden Knights, as we talked about, uh, clinching their playoff spot, they keep on winning, including that shootout victory over the Wild on Monday night. Yet goaltending remains by far their biggest question mark in Sin City. And with four goalies currently on NHL one-way contracts, the first team ever in NHL history to win four straight games using four different goalies, who in your mind takes the crease for game one of round one? I think it's pretty safe to say that Logan Thompson will not be that goalie. Of course, he was an all-star for Vegas this year, has played largely as the number one when he was healthy and available. But Bruce Cassidy said last Wednesday that Thompson was nowhere near being on the ice. With playoffs starting in two weeks or so, Frank, I just don't see him being available. So let's whittle this down. You got Laurent Brossois versus Jonathan Quick. Jonathan Quick is going to go tonight playing against the Predators. But the last three games have all belonged to Laurent Brossois, and he's gone 3-0-1. So here's the thing for Brossois. He's only played eight games with Vegas this year, but he did play 23 in the American League with Henderson while recovering from off-season hip surgery. Look at the numbers here. Brossois 3-0-1 in his last five games, a 902 save percentage, which is which is fine. 271 goals against, but look at quick. 864 save percentage. He was pulled after 40 minutes against Edmonton after allowing six goals in his last start, and it was really ugly in that game. The eye test just isn't good for Jonathan Quick, and it hasn't been for several years. It's continued with the Vegas Golden Knights. In his six starts, he's allowed three goals or more. Or six to seven starts, he's allowed three goals or more. So as much as I thought that this was going to be Quick's crease heading towards the Stanley Cup playoffs, of course, having two Stanley Cups under his belt along with a Conn Smythe trophy, if Brassois keeps up this pace of play, I think he's got an inside track because he's a much more consistent goaltender in his routes, his movements, his safe selections. He's predictable. And Bruce Cassidy likes predictable. So um, I think this one could be really interesting, though, because Quick's resume speaks for itself, Frank. 
Yeah, it does. But as you can see here with the numbers, he's come back to earth after a hot few games with the Golden Knights coming over from that trade via Columbus. And so, you know, from a statistical standpoint, it's pretty clear probably who should be in net. But that pedigree, as we just talked about with Marc-Andre Fleury, really seems to mean a lot. So let's go to the LA Kings, Quick's former team, and also a potential first-round opponent for the Golden Knights. Um, they've made a big splash at the trade deadline. Eunice Corpus Salo has been really nothing but sublime since coming over. So he has to be the lock to start for the Kings in Game 1, no? Well, the problem is that Phoenix Copley just, just keeps winning, man. Like, in his last six games, Copley's 5-0-1. Corpus Allo's 4-2-1 in his last six appearances. So, you know, how do you factor it in? Well, there's a couple things at play here, okay? Corpus Allo and his eight starts with the LA Kings, four of them have come against playoff teams. And you look at Copley's last six games, how many of those came against playoff teams? Just one. He's had the easier schedule. And Copley's numbers, you look, it's a 9-12 save percentage compared to what Corpus Allo's done since coming over in a 9-38. Um, Corpus Allo's at a 9-17 on the season, and most of that was behind a really porous defense with the Columbus Blue Jackets, and Copley's at 9-01. It's just Copley's 24-4-3. You can't deny that in, in that as a record. Thing is, though, Frank, and you've seen this a bunch of times, Teams don't trade for goaltenders like a Corpus Allo, who does have playoff experience in the NHL dating back to the 2020 bubble when he helped the Blue Jackets knock off the Maple Leafs in the first round with an unbelievable performance and carried it into the second round against Tampa Bay. You don't trade for a goalie like that and leave him on the bench, especially when he's come in and performed. So even though Copley and Corpus Allo have split the net since Corpus Allo came over, I do think it's a lock that, he, that Corpus Allo is the starting goalie for the Kings when the playoffs begin. I agree with you. Even though 24, 4, and 3 is hard to argue with, Copley's save percentage and numbers really are lacking, especially compared to Corpus Allo. And if you extrapolate those numbers even a little bit further out, they're incredibly impressive. Someone that really has had his game together all year. Uh, Mike, so many interesting Coley decisions. We didn't even end up talking about the Edmonton Oilers. I think it's, you know, seems pretty obvious to me that Stuart Skinner is the guy in game one, but. Yeah. I don't know, Jack Campbell, how do you then go and sell that on the next years of his contract? There's so many things to figure Great out. Question. And then thanks to Mike McKenna for this week's edition of The Blue Paint. All right, Mike, time for our daily face-off inbox question of the day. Thanks for watching a log on our YouTube stream. And thanks to Chris for firing this question into the chat. Chris Noss asks, could Oilers GM Ken Holland be up for GM of the year? Chris thinks he could at least be a candidate. What say you, Mike? Uh, I'd be surprised. Uh, I do like the Ekholm trade at the deadline, but how many other eye-catching moves were made to make the Edmonton Oilers better in season and to mold the team towards the Stanley Cup playoffs? I think he'd kind of be a long shot. There's other, other GMs, I think, that have had to do a lot more with a lot less this year. What say you? Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised um, if he gets votes or consideration. Uh, I would put a few guys ahead of him. I would put uh, Tom Fitzgerald of the New Jersey Devils. Uh, really kind of an un understated summer. Uh, the John Marino trade was big. They reshaped their goaltending with Vitek Vanacek. And then the big Timo Meyer trade um, at the deadline. The Rangers have obviously done big things with Chris Drury. Um, adding two pretty significant pieces in Tarasenko and Patrick Kane. Um, but then I also think of the Minnesota Wild uh, and their GM and Bill Guerin. Not a bunch of, you know, eye-popping moves, but the Philip Gustafson one was a stroke of genius. And to shave off uh, a million bucks or more on your salary cap and flipping Cam Talbot. Um, and really just kind of the boldness of going with the Parise and Suter buyouts to think that this team is this competitive with $12.5 million in dead cap space. Like they started out in an $82.5 million league with a $70 million ceiling. That's, that's hard to win. And so they've been good and probably also need to give a little love to Rob Blake and the LA Kings. I mean, yeah. when you think about their summer, how many people really were talking about Kevin Fiala coming in and leading the Kings in scoring this season. And we just talked about the Corpus Allo and Gabrikov trade and how that's paid huge dividends for the Kings in net. Unpopular at the time, 
trading away a franchise icon and Jonathan Quick, but certainly seems to be the best move for the Kings. So those are my thoughts. Thanks to Chris for uh, our Ask DFO inbox question of the day. That brings us to our Daily Bets segment presented by Botano. Tyler, how are you doing? I am doing good. Well, I didn't do good last night, but as a whole in life, I'm doing well, Frank. So thank you for asking. Uh, I got three plays for tonight's <laughs> NHL slate brought to you by Batano. Uh, and you know what? Here's the thing I love about Batano. They have a little perk in terms of NHL betting where if the team you bet on goes up by three goals, you win your bet, even if they blow the lead. So I'm taking a look at the slate, and there's one team I like to not just win, but also cover the puck line. When I loaded up the odds today, I was fully expecting this Colorado-San Jose matchup to be one of those games where the abs were like minus 400 or something like that. I quickly noticed San Jose's won three games in a row somehow. I don't like them to win a fourth. I like Colorado to roll. They've won eight of 10. They got a chance to clinch tonight if a few other things break their way. I like taking Colorado on the puck line at plus 105. Edmonton and LA for about a month straight. The over was an absolute lock for the Edmonton Oilers, but back to back shutouts by Stuart Skinner and Jack Campbell. The unders hit in two in a row. The unders also hit in four in a row for the LA Kings in seven of their last 10. I fully expect these two to play another tight checking, low scoring game like they did last week. I'm taking the under there and a quick player prop. Darnell Nurse has hit his shot prop in four straight games. He's Rushed it in a couple of those. It set it two and a half and paying plus money. Take the nurse shot prop, Oilers and Kings under, Avs and Sharks minus one and a half. Or sorry, the Avs to beat the Sharks by two or more. There you go, Frank. Those are my three plays brought to you by Batano. 19 plus. Please play responsibly. So, Tyler, let me ask just so you can explain it to me like I'm five years old. So, you take the Avs on the puck line tonight and they go up three nothing against the Sharks. You automatically win your bet. Sorry, that's uh, just, I, I misspoke there. It's just for money line bets. So if you bet on a team on the money line, they go up by three goals, your bet wins. Even if the other team scores five and wins five, three, you still win. It's like an early payout automatic thing that Patano offers. Pretty cool. Yeah, I love that. And so you don't have to do anything extra to get that. Once you place the money line bet, you're good. You're good. Oh, I love to hear that. Welcome in Batano.ca to the Daily Faceoff and Nation Network family. We are thrilled to have you. That brings us to Garbage Time with Mike McKenna. Mike, what's caught your eye? What's caught your attention from around the National Hockey League? Uh, you know, it's really been the load management that's taking place in the NHL right now. And the Bruins have kind of been at the forefront of it. Now, you've seen NBA teams do this previously down the stretch, sit players for a long length of time. And you, know, you see this tweet from a couple of days ago about how Patrice Bergeron's going to sit, Marchant, Lindholm, well, nagging injuries. What that really means, Frank, is that we're just going to rest these guys, okay? Because most teams in the NHL, their players at this stage are somewhere between 75 and 90% if you're lucky at this point of the season. And it kind of is a mental hurdle for players to realize, I think, that it's okay to sit a game, right? They used to have so much pride always playing. The key part to this, though, the Bruins have nothing to lose. They've already clinched the President's Trophy. So they can sit their players all they want. The only other two teams I think that could do that are the Leafs and the, and the Lightning. And we have seen the Leafs do similar just the other night. McCabe and Giordano took the night off. So it's something that I think is going to happen more often in hockey. I don't think it's as hard of a sell on the players as it used to be, but man, it used to be like pulling teeth, saying to a player like, hey, we need you to take the night off. What? Are you crazy? I'm not coming out of the lineup, even for games that didn't matter at the end. So it's something to keep an eye on. And I think the smart teams, if they have the availability to rest some players, they should utilize this. Yeah, I agree. Um, it's hard to get players sort of over the hump to get there though. Um, I don't know. It, it's going to be... You mentioned the Bruins and sort of the spot that they're in, though. They don't really have a lot to play for from the President's Trophy perspective, but they are chasing history in a way that really hasn't been talked about all that much. We've been talking about this record-breaking team. They have 125 points, and they have five games to play. It would be pretty amazing if in the fifth game, the last game of the season in Montreal, by the way, where Jim Montgomery is from, if they have a chance to break the all-time points record in that span, the record is 132 held by also those Montreal Canadiens and the Bruins sit at 125. So their max points remaining is 10. Be pretty amazing to see them end up at 135. Yep. I'd say they might do it. I'd see, I think you'd see a full lineup if they've got the record on the slate, Frank. 
maybe that's why they're resting guys now. Let's see how close they get. Uh, thanks to Mike McKenna for today's edition of Daily Faceoff Live. Great show. Thank you to everyone who watched along on our YouTube stream as well. Give us a like, give us a subscribe, and we'll be back 12 noon Eastern on Wednesday. You know where to find us. Until then, have a great day and enjoy the slate of games, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to Daily Faceoff Live. Make sure you hit the subscribe button to never miss an episode.